Uh, I'm here because I'm looking for every opportunity I can to reduce my expenses, protect my staff, and keep deputy sheriffs on the street, uh, answering calls for service and ensuring that we all live in a safe community. I've lost nearly 25% of my resources, funding, and staffing in the last three fiscal cycles because of unprecedented declines in revenue. I've lost 120 positions, $21 million, and I struggle to adequately protect the, the community to deal with issues like gangs and methamphetamine. Now, I will tell you that uh, this bill, as presented, uh, will reduce our expenses, but we're not really um, abusing anybody by doing this. And, and I want to direct your attention. I don't know if you've received uh, the uh, facts this morning to Senator Canella's office from the Consumer Attorneys of California, uh, but quite frankly, I'm offended, and, uh, and and this is just an outrageous accusation that I, as the sheriff, um, would place inmates that are in my alternative work program in dangerous settings and circumstances. That's simply not true. Uh, the opposition here that indicates that there's no incentive for supervisors at the city or county jails to provide a safe working environment is, is ludicrous. We have a terrific uh, partnership with the community, many, many partnerships in the community with education, the faith-based community, service, civic, charitable, uh, business, agriculture, all focused on programs that provide educational, rehabilitative, and, and vocational opportunities for inmates, and we're focused on breaking cycles of addiction and violence. Do we utilize inmates for community projects? Absolutely. Uh, community beautification, graffiti abatement, landscape services, uh, picking up illegally dumped trash, but we provide a safe and secure working environment, proper training, protective clothing and equipment, but unfortunately there are still those in the system who abuse the system. And these are taxpayer dollars we're talking about here. We should not be providing temporary or permanent disability benefits to someone who's never had a job who doesn't have any history of wages. And really, you know, this is a wage replacement benefit. So purely from the standpoint of being more effective and efficient with the taxpayer's money and reducing our expenses to protect public safety, I urge all of you to support Senator Canella's uh, uh, Senate Bill 407. Thank you. Thank you for your service in law enforcement. Thank you. I'm Peggy Hansinger, I'm the Disability Manager with Stanislaus County, and I want to thank uh, Senator Canella for taking up this bill. It's awesome, and I, I, I really hope that you'll strongly consider it and vote yes to pass it on through. Um, just a few things that I wanted to point out to you. I mean, they both covered quite a bit of things that I would have said anyway, but um, Labor Code 3351 and 3352 address who is an employee, who is covered under workers' compensation. And in most cases, inmates and volunteers are not uh, covered under workers' compensation. Our county, along with many other counties in the state, have voluntarily agreed to provide workers' comp to inmates and volunteers. I know we're not talking about volunteers today, but they fall under the same class, basically, because they are volunteering their work or their service to the county and to other organizations. Now, because we've volunteered to provide workers' comp, um, this is an impact to us. And as the sheriff mentioned, his budget has been stripped and continues to do so. And I am a member of this community, and I want to see my money go toward law enforcement and not to rewarding criminals. But getting back to the point of workers' comp, um, this bill takes the minimum temporary disability down to actual wages if they're less than what the current statutory minimum requires. And as the sheriff has mentioned, this is a wage replacement benefit. So if you had no earned wage uh, history, you would not receive any temporary disability. And that's the same with state disability or unemployment. If you ha don't have proof of earnings, you're not going to collect those benefits either. It's not a punishment. And if, since the, the uh, county has to take on so many prisoners that would have been at state level, and state prisoners only receive the minimum temporary disability, and they do not receive um, anything while they're incarcerated, the same should apply to local governments as well. It doesn't make sense to provide more benefits at a local level than we do at a state level. Um, let's see. Oh, and as far as OSHA, the concern about OSHA not applying, OSHA absolutely would respond if somebody were in, had a serious injury. Inmate, volunteer, a regular employee. It doesn't matter. As long as they're covered under workers' comp performing real work, we are obligated to provide a safe work environment and safety training. And like I said, if something were to happen, OSHA would investigate, and if we had done something wrong, we would be fined. So this um, bill does not change those requirements for us at all. 
I could give you some um, anecdotal history about some inmates that we've paid for losses in the past. Um, some, for example, many of them that we've had injuries on with the Sheriff's Department is because they came to pre-existing conditions. We've had uh, inmates who've had history of multiple shoulder dislocation who, through workers' comp are receiving shoulder replacement surgery and benefits. We've had people who have had multiple hernias coming to the Sheriff's Office, lifting something and, you know, aggravating the hernia. We've had to pay for the hernia surgery and their temporary disability and permanent disability. Recently, we had one that he received $60,000 dollars for his hernia for in permanent disability not solely because of um, the sheriff but he had multiple employers and that was an agreement we had to settle with everybody this really adds to our litigation costs and the other um, thing that is not currently addressed in the bill that um, was in the original bill language was that the sheriff would have absolute medical control over the uh, medical care for inmates mm -hmm. and while this bill does not address that it's silent on it if this bill passes and we're not responsible for temporary disability or, or permanent disability while they're incarcerated, the sheriff can provide medical care to them through jail medical. And that alone is going to save a lot of money for the sheriff's department in his time having to send his deputies to take these inmates to outside medical treatment when it's something that the jail is perfectly capable of handling. And if it's a serious uh, injury or illness, they would receive outside medical care the same as they would if they sustained an injury just while um, being a prisoner or an inmate, not working. So they would receive the same care, working or not working. So uh, this bill, I think, is awesome, and I really hope that you will support it and, and give an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Oh, we have some more witnesses in support. Sure. Uh, Mr. Morning. Chairman, if you'll excuse me, I have a memorial service to attend. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Karen Lang on behalf of the Placer and Stanislaus County Boards of Supervisors. In Placer County, they spend $70,000 in these kinds of costs, and they would prefer to redirect that to public safety programs and not, not to uh, minimum temporary disability for inmates. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Daniel Higgs on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in strong support of this bill. The 58 sheriffs of the state of California do echo the comments made earlier by Sheriff Christensen. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mike Carroll with the California Applicant Attorneys Association, and yes, I almost did say Western Center on Law and Poverty. Um, um, I'm here today in opposition to SB 407, and I guess um, your analysis does an excellent job, I think, of going through and looking at all the takeaways that this, uh, this bill does from the existing protections that exist for our state prisoners. Um, this essentially goes through that statute and whacks away six rights that exist in that, uh, in that statute right now for prisoners, and I'll talk about some of those in a moment. But I guess I, what I want to underscore here is that w your committee is being asked to approve a bill to um, take money away from people who are injured on the job as a way to pay for the potential cost of new prisoners, which may come through a realignment proposal, which I don't believe is yet law or has happened. And so... Uh, but at some core, I guess I, we have to just question, you know, what value we're imposing here and what it seems to be is that we're really just saying that um, we're going to take money away from people who can't defend themselves and we're going to strip away their legal rights to defend themselves so that we can pay them whatever we'd like. And that's, in our view, really what this bill comes down to. Um, and in particular, I mean, it takes away basic legal protections, like the right to have a notice when you start the work of your rights at, if, you're an in, if you become injured on the job. Uh, without notice, um, people simply don't know what their rights are, they are not informed, and they are subject to being abused within the system. It also takes away the right to appeal before the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. Um, again, a fundamental right, it seems to us, is to have a neutral arbiter hear your case. So these are the kind of examples that we see taken away in this bill that would really make these injured workers who happen to be inmates, um, um, a, you know, a second class citizen within this system and making sure that they can be essentially used as workers but not compensated the way that everyone else is. And we stand opposed to this bill and we urge you a no vote. 
Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation, also here in opposition. Just stepping back, we all know the economy that we're in. We know that we have record high unemployment. Many, many families in this state are struggling with unemployment. When a, a parent, a family member, ends up in county jail um, and is asked to do potentially a very dangerous job like fighting fires or highway cleanup and is injured and therefore not able to provide for their family in the future, that's exactly what temporary disability benefits are supposed to be there for. Um, and the reality is we are generally speaking about very low income families who are gonna have really very few options uh, to provide that minimal level of support. Um, and in many cases are gonna have to look toward to other kinds of um, uh, other kinds of public benefits, because if if the intended benefit, which is if you're injured on the job, it's supposed to be temporary disability. If that's not made available, many families are going to have to rely on the um, safety net, which we all know is has been shredded. Um, and so we think that this is just a uh, the, the the impact of this bill would be essentially to take away from the very poorest and to deny um, people who were injured on the job the proper remedy. Um, tying it to prison wages, I mean, we're talking about incarcerated labor, which is already raises a lot of issues, right, for, for people who are incarcerated to be doing these jobs and not to be getting paid um, what other workers would be paid, to be paid pennies on the dollar. And so to tie wages to, um, to inmate wages doesn't really make any sense to us. So we are here in opposition. Thank you. Any other witnesses? Any questions from committee members? Can we rebut anything that was said? Or Go ahead. Okay. Just um, as far as uh, inmates not receiving or having to do difficult work in the fire suppression, that is only allowed currently at the state level. Um, this bill does not take away anything at the state level. It only addresses uh, inmates at the county and city level. We don't have um, inmates do difficult or dangerous work at the county and city level. And for us, uh, Inmate work is all voluntary. It's never mandated. It, they can do it if they want to just to relieve some of the boredom that they sustained while they are incarcerated. And as far as um, taking away benefits from a family when they are incarcerated, they're not working while they're in jail anyway, so there's nothing to take away from the family at that time for the benefits that cease while they're in custody. As far as um, once they are released, receiving benefits after custody, that's true. They would be down to the minimum uh, temporary disability benefit, but that's the same as the state would allow. So again, um, we're not harming uh, county jail personnel. It, we're just treating them the same as we would in the prison system. So I'm not sure what else she said that, or they said that yeah, I would like to comment it. on. Um, well, I just want to add that I think it's a great common sense bill. It makes sense for our communities and counties and local governments to have this flexibility here. And uh, I think you answered all the questions right there from the uh, opponents. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. San Leno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have great sensitivity to the sheriff and to those at the county level who are trying to make ends meet right now. And I can't argue that some of the points you make uh, have some impact, but at the same time, we're looking at a problem here with regard to funding for public safety programs that is far greater than this bill. So I, whereas I'm sensitive to some of the arguments you've made, I'm also very sensitive to the arguments that the opposition has made that oftentimes individuals from low-income families who get caught up in the criminal justice system, some rightly, some wrongly, find themselves incarcerated and may be injured, which can affect their ability to earn for their family's well-being once they are released. So I have a sensitivity there too. But the bigger issue here, the much bigger issue here, cannot go overlooked, that there is a voice in this capital, as Governor Schwarzenegger so succinctly put it, time and time again, to starve the beast of government. That's the problem we have here. We have been cutting back and cutting back and cutting back. And to suggest that your or any other local agency's fiscal problems are in any way going to be significantly improved by this sort of legislation as opposed to 
funding government to the level that it needs to be funded uh, is just confusing the matter. So I would be very eager to work with you to make sure the governor's proposal to fund public safety programs is addressed minimally to let voters have their say. That's the problem here. So again, you've made some good arguments, but it, this is a delicate issue, and I won't be able to support the bill today. When we uh, have a quorum, we'll uh, take action on your bill. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, Senator Corbett is next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, this is Senate Bill 459. The bill is intended to reduce the likelihood that employees will be mass misclassified as independent contractors. When a worker is misclassified, it affects the way our California labor laws, such as minimum wage, overtime protection, workers' compensation coverage, family leave, and unemployment insurance are applied. The misclassification of workers results in a loss of payroll tax revenue and often an increased reliance on state-funded public services. And we all know how scarce those are right now. It also creates an unfair playing field for responsible employers who honor their lawful obligations to their employees. Specifically, 459 prohibits the willful misclassification of an employee as an independent contractor, provides that a consultant who knowingly misadvises an employer is jointly liable if the worker is found not to be an independent contractor and requires that independent <coughs> contractors be provided with information about their, their classification, their tax obligations, and other relevant information and be told how to request a determination from the State Employment Development Department to determine uh, if they are correctly classified. Members. According to the General Accounting Office, at least 10 million workers are classified as independent contractors nationally, an increase of more than 2 million in just six years. SB 459 provides simple steps to ensure workers are properly classified, and this measure is supported by the California Labor Federation, the California Teamsters Consumer Affairs Council, excuse me, Public Affairs Council, the Communication Workers of America District 9, the State Building Construction Trades Council, Consumer Attorneys of California, the California Nurses Association, AFSCME, and many others. Uh, there's a number of people here to testify in support, and uh, thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Go ahead. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. We are proud to be sponsors of this bill. Over the past decade, we have witnessed a real transformation in um, the nature of work in, in California and nationwide. And we have increasingly seen um, the employer-employee relationship uh, be further and further uh, undermined by the use of labor contractors, temporary agencies, and most importantly, um, misclassification of workers as independent contractors. When a worker is misclassified, they lose out on everything, every protection that we argue over in this committee, every protection that the legislature um, has passed to ensure that workers have some basic rights, uh, independent contractors don't have any of those. So it's extremely harmful to a worker. It means that you don't qualify for unemployment if you are laid off. It means that um, you don't, you're not even entitled to the minimum wage. You have basically no protections. Um, you don't even have workers' compensation coverage if you're injured at work. But this independent, uh, the misclassification of independent contractors is not just bad for workers. It creates an unfair playing field for responsible employers who then have to compete with businesses that have no workers' compensation and no pay, 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 pay no payroll taxes. Um, and it also deprives the state of much needed revenue. Uh, states across the country have begun to look more closely at the problem of misclassification as they have seen the incredible hit that it causes to their budgets, um, as well as the harm caused to workers. So for our unions, this has become a top priority. Uh, in California, the way that uh, independent contractor is defined is if an employer 
has control over the worker and the way they are doing the work. That's a worker, that's not an independent contractor. You can call them an independent contractor, you can make them sign a contract saying they're an independent contractor, but that doesn't change the underlying facts that you are the employer, you are in control of that worker, and you should have the same responsibilities that all other responsible employers uh, have. And so what we have done in this bill is we have specifically looked at the problem of willful misclassification where employers knowingly and intentionally misclassify workers to gain an unfair advantage over their competitors. We have looked at the problem of third party consultants who recklessly promote misclassification schemes um, and try to make them have some accountability so that they're not just putting employers on the hook. Um, and we have looked at trying to empower workers through getting information about the way that they've been classified and what that impact is gonna be on them and their family. And so uh, this is a top priority for us and for our unions, and we ask for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Shane Gussman, on behalf of the Teamsters, uh, the Amalgamated Transit Union, United Fruit and Commercial Workers, the Machinists, Unite Here, um, uh, the ILWU and others in strong support of this bill. I think uh, the previous speaker uh, explained very well what the bill does. I, I, I do wanna uh, address what the bill doesn't do. The bill doesn't outlaw the use of independent contractors. It doesn't touch the underlying law of what is an independent contractor and who is not an independent contractor. The bill simply goes after the people that are already engaged in illegal activity, and it provides a little information to workers. So we think it's good policy, and we urge your support. Other witnesses in support? Good morning, Mr. Chair. Patrick Hamby, have the California State Council of Labor. We are talking about willful misclassification. This is not an accident. This is a willful act uh, by an employer to misclassify their employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're also talking about here in the bill just allowing the employer to know whether or not they are an employee or an independent contractor. We think that this is a logical uh, provision of law that will hopefully give some clarity uh, and support. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Mariko Yoshihara with the California Employment Lawyers Association. For all the reasons previously stated, we are in strong support. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Jeremy Smith on behalf of the State Building and Construction Trades Council, also in support. Any other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chair and members, uh, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the Messenger Courier Association of America, California Grocers Association. Um, first of all, we are not here to defend the bad actor, instead the good actor. Uh, the uh, author and sponsor talked about the lawful employer, and I think that's what our fundamental concern is. Um, first of all, the language in the bill provides a standard that is, uh, let me just have it is voluntary and incidental, although uh, the proponents talked about uh, knowingly uh, being the standard. The other issue that I would like to talk about is also mentioned by the sponsor, which is the general right of control. I think the fundamental problem that the employer community has is the different sets of standards. Uh, even the Department of Industrial Relations website says you may be an employee for one purpose with one state entity, but you could be an independent contractor for another. And the lack of clear objective standards for determining who is an independent contractor versus an employee is the fundamental problem that we have and would like to see addressed. What we're looking for is some sort of safe harbor, if you will, some clear delineation of who is or is not an independent contractor. If that law is then violated, clearly there is no issue with punishing the bad actor, the willful misclassification. The problem again is the lack of clarity. The labor code uh, statutory definition also talks about right of control. 
Unfortunately, the EDD and other state agencies use a myriad of factors. In fact, the legislation calls for the notice to be given to uh, workers. It cites that EDD shall provide a list of factors. What are those factors and will a majority of them demonstrate independent contractor status versus employee status? Today, EDD uses generally 14 factors, the Barillo factors. One of them, many of them talk about right of control or allude to that, just like the statutory definition. Unfortunately, EDD, in a myriad of circumstances, has instead, instead overridden the general right of control uh, provisions and found an employment, contact, an employment situation just taking one individual factor. So for the employee and the employer to have the list of factors provides little helpful guidance because today we know that EDD and other state departments and agency uh, utilize or give greater weight to different factors than a different state department or agency. Um, one minor item, the, the bill also provides a misdemeanor um, for negligence. Uh, page 5, line 39. We'd prefer to see negligence struck for purposes of creating criminal liability. All the other provisions, the willful refusal, the failure to comply, might be appropriate for a misdemeanor, but negligence, I think, is uh, excessive. So again, I think from my client's standpoint, we would prefer to have clear objective standards provided to the employer community um, and provide some benefit to the lawful employer, the lawful user of independent contractors. Thank you. Good morning, members. Jennifer Barrera on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce, and we are also in opposition to this bill for similar reasons as stated by Mr. McKaylee. Um, you know, our members aren't opposed to going after the underground economy and the bad actors because those certainly affect our members just as well. Um, but this bill doesn't just impact the bad actors, it impacts the good actors as well who are trying to comply with the law. But yet because we have such a subjective standard right now of what constitutes an independent contractor, they could have gone through the 24 factors that the EDD lists as um, uh, determining whether or not a person is an independent contractor, looked at 23 of those and thought that they were good, but yet the EDD comes back and says, well, we think the 24th factor is the most controlling here, and so we're going to find that the person's an employee instead of an independent contractor. And uh, I disagree with the supporters that says there is a set definition in California for what an independent contractor is. As the Department of Industrial Relations states on their website, there is no set definition of the term independent contractor for all purposes. And they admit that their determination of an independent contractor could be very different from what the EDD determines as an independent contractor. As Mr. McKaylee pointed out, this bill requires uh, the employer to provide the individual with a notice that sets forth the EDD factors for determining an independent contractor at the beginning of the relationship. Yet it's the Labor Workforce and Development Agency who has the authority under the bill to determine whether a violation has occurred and then assess a penalty against the employer for $25,000, or excuse me, up to $25,000. Um, we have two different agencies here who admittedly don't follow the same test for independent contractors, and it puts an employer in an impossible position of trying to comply with the law. So. Our position is if you're going to hold an employer for um, liable for willful misclassification, you first need to put forth an objective, uniform standard that all employers know what it is and can follow that all the agencies agree on, and then if that is violated, then hold the person responsible for willful misclassification because that will differentiate between the good actors and the bad actors, the ones who are trying to follow the law and the ones who are trying to evade the law to get some benefit out of it. And so for those reasons, we oppose uh, SB 459. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Dean Heil. I'm with the Direct Selling Association. We represent companies such as Mary Kay and Avon. We have some concerns about the bill, but we are very appreciative of the conversations we've had with legislative staff to address them. That's all. Any other witnesses? Good morning. 
Paloma Perez with Consumer Attorneys. We're actually in support, but I was running over from Assembly Insurance. Just wanted to voice our support for SB 459. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, members, George Miller on behalf of the California Trucking Association in opposition. Any other witnesses? Would the author like to respond to some of their opposition? Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm glad that we're all in agreement that what we're doing here is going after the, the bad actors. There's no intention to catch people up in some sort of gotcha situation. And I do believe that um, the underlying law and the bill is clear. However, uh, we have uh, been talking with opposition to work with them to give them a level of comfort that we can clarify matters in the bill uh, to the extent that it, it is appropriate. And just to clear a few things up, for example, uh, it should have been stated that if an employer is not clear on whether there is a violation, they can ask for a determination to make sure that they're, they're doing the right thing before there's some sort of action against them. So that's a very important point to make. Uh, and the departments take a look at the specific case-by-case -case situation in their analysis. But the website, uh, the industrial, uh, uh, industrial relations website, does make a statement that was referenced by the opposition, but it also makes a statement a little further uh, on in the website where it is clarified uh, that an individual will be considered an employee where the employer exercises all necessary control by direct or indirect means over the work details of the inv individual. So there's additional information on that website that should, hope with, should help with clarification. So I think um, the, the important points I would make um, are uh, we're, we're glad to continue to work with the opposition because clarity is what we're seeking. We want to make sure that these laws are followed so that our state um, revenue sources are not impacted because people are not able to um, take advantage of the law or that the law cannot be followed in the way that it should be applied. So we're glad to continue to work with them. and. Um, you know, it's, it's an important laws that we put on the books that we work diligently on here in the Capitol for protection or to, uh, you know, help guide folks um, that they can be followed clearly um, and, uh, you know, not create burdens for our employers. Thank you. So um, I am troubled by the fact that some employers have a lack of clarity as to what mm -hmm. the laws and regulations are. And to an extent, you can continue working with them Absolutely. to make sure that the good actors know that they're being good. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to support the bill today, but if you could work with the opposition, that'd be terrific. That's my goal. <laughs> Senator Wiley? Um, since it seems to me there's, there's a couple of major issues, and one is the lack of clarity. And uh, I've experienced that myself uh, being in business. Um, it is sometimes unclear and uh, the employer wants to do the right thing with very 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 few exceptions but you don't know now the primary one you try to look at is the supervisorial authority but as you, that you cite but as was pointed out uh, there are all these other criteria and the experience of many employers is different agencies will interpret those tri criteria differently. And I wish were there uh, a determination that the employer had made an error, I wish an employer could rely on the state to fairly determine whether it was willful and fairly look at it, but unfortunately, my direct experience with the state and many of its agencies is that it is not fair. Um, and I wish it were different. So what I would ask the author is, uh, I doubt uh, Senator Corbett, you are willing to do this, but repair the major concern 
hold hold the bill, repair the major concern, <clears throat> which all the employers are asking for, so they can do the right thing, and make it absolutely clear with greater definition, so they can make sure they can. Because I know in our own case, some are easy. Some of those classifications are really easy. Some get really tough. They do get really tough. Say you've got someone out on a work site, and they're out on that work site, for example, and they're the supervisor. They're the person who's supposed to actually make sure that the crews are in the right places doing the right things. But it's certainly possible during the day that they go in and help someone do something uh, if, if someone's act, uh, and, and that they don't work all day, but they help someone do something, well then, does that vitiate their classification? And it's so easy for an agency to come in, and especially the kind of people they would pick out was, well, this person's on a job site. Well, the reality is you have to have someone supervising out there. And I know lots of people, and we have them in our employ, whose job was to supervise. But it didn't mean that they might, as an example, might not do something. The other concern that I have um, is that, as I understand under current law, and I'm a little concerned that this could also be reinforced in judiciary, the private right of action. And my understanding is even under current law and code sections that are cited, you could have that. And as the author knows, um, I think, let me make this clear, I believe strongly in tort law and the, and the tort system. I think that's a part of, as I understand, English common law going way back. But it's abused. I've been subject to the abuse. I've been subject to the abuse when summary judgments have been issued. Summary judgments, meaning that trial lawyers want to get before a jury. They want to get there to make money out of employers. They want to get there to drive up insurance rates. And the reason this body, uh, in the first or second year I was here, changed the rules. This is very, very, very subtle. Most people wouldn't have any idea about how it works. But they changed the rules regarding summary judgment. And to make sure everyone understands what that is, that's when you go into court and you say, hey, you know what? There's no legal basis for this suit. There's just no legal basis. We shouldn't even hear the facts. And the law was that the preponderance of evidence the judge was supposed to consider because they want to have a trial of the facts, is that if there's any way you could interpret that law, any way that you should have a full hearing in a, in a, in a court, they should interpret that way. But so many of these cases, and I was subject to one, it was absurd. Well, they changed it to make it harder. And that's the kind of abuse that I'm also very concerned about, and uh, excuse me for getting animated about it, but I don't think there's a single employer who's been subjected to one of those cases who isn't pretty upset about it. So to me, if the author would put in the bill that literally this would never be subject to a private cause of action and would define clearly so employers said, you know what, now we know, I'd vote for this bill. But those are my concerns and why I can't vote for it today. Thank you, Senator. Would you like to close? You know what, I, I just quickly add, I believe in the intent. I believe any employer who willfully does that, you know, absent these other things, should be, you know, as an employer who did it right and always tried to do it right, I, I agree with the basic idea behind it. Okay, great. So let's work together, let's make it clear, and let's make it work. I'm not prepared to hold the bill in committee today. The bill is double referred. This is the first stop on a long legislative journey, as you know. And uh, uh, I've been very, <laughs> I, I've been uh, uh, very open to work with the opposition, and I will continue to do that. Um, really, the goal is is to provide the information to employers and to make it clear, and that will deter any opportunities to end up in court. So let's do that, and uh, ask for your I vote. Thank you. So uh, all three of us sitting up here came from business, and clarity is something businesses seek. To extent you can do that, that would be great. 
and uh, when we have a quorum, we'll take action on the bill. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Senator De Leon is next. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair Weilin, Mr. Leno, uh, as well as members. Thank you for the opportunity to hear uh, SB 432 today. This is an issue that's very close to my heart uh, because my mother was a housekeeper. In fact, she was a housekeeper the vast majority of her life, and she spent the vast majority of her life cleaning other people's homes and other people's hotel rooms in some of the most exclusive areas in the state of California, La Jolla as well as Coronado. Housekeepers have the highest rate of lower back injuries in the, hotel injur in the hotel industry. And simply put, these workers deserve much better. Housekeepers perform the same cleaning routine day in and day out, suffering injuries from repetitive straining over time. With the hard work, the many advocates for these women, workplace injuries have in fact decreased, but still housekeepers have the highest rate of injury in all of the hotel in industry, 50% higher than other hotel workers. SB 42 would require hotels to use fitted sheets, just like the sheets we use in our own homes. So housekeepers don't have to lift the heavy mattresses to change flat sheets. Anyone who's been in a hotel recently, especially the past uh, few years, has probably noticed the very luxurious plush pillow top high-tech mattresses that are wonderful for a good night's sleep. Unfortunately, these mattresses easily weigh over 150 pounds and have led to increased rates of back and shoulder injuries for housekeepers. Hotels purchase new sheets on an annual basis, but it's up to us to recommend this change for the industry. SB 432 would also require long handled tools to stop the practice of housekeepers being required to clean bathroom floors on their knees and hands. These workers clean 20 to 30 rooms a day, year after year and are working in constant pain. These hotels have moved to a long, the, the hotels that have moved to long handled tools have improved the lives of their workers without compromising the quality of service. Here with me to testify is the Al California Applicant Attorney Association representative, Tommy Ruda Flores, and two housekeepers. We have Nanita Ibe, from, who's been a housekeeper for over 10 years, and Gilda Vallejo, who's been a housekeeper for over 13 years. Uh, members of this committee, uh, Mr. Chair, I respectfully ask for a bipartisan support of this measure. Uh, before we hear from witnesses, we're going to establish a quorum. Uh, roll call. Lou? Here. Wyland? Here. Desonier? Leno? Here. Padilla? Runner? Here. And Yee? Okay, we have a quorum. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, my name is Tommy Reda Flores, and I'm a proud member of the California Applicants Attorneys Association who is sponsoring this bill, as well as the Workplace Safety Bill with United Here, the Teamsters, United Food and Commercial Workers, and Maria Elena Durazo. And I like to say, history often repeats itself, and it could be a great thing. But before I get into the history part about it, I must say the following. People often accuse lawyers such as myself, of caring for people only after they are injured in order to reach that financial gain in a lawsuit. However, this bill, the one we are sponsoring today, is to help the housekeepers that are here before you in this room to avoid being our clients and suffering injuries. For example, you have been given uh, information about Cal OSHA and, and the data about using flat sheets, so I'll just bring up a few points here. Using flat sheets instead of fitted ones 
leads to increasing back and shoulder injuries of these people that have to lift 16 to 32 times a day in their hotel rooms to fit these sheets. If the, if the use of the fitted sheets would actually decrease the injuries, which would promote, promote less workplace injuries, which will promote health in the workplace for these families that work there and reduce costs since there will be less worker injuries and thus will be more cost accountability and less injuries that would have to be paid out in workers' comp benefits and premiums. In fact, the, work, the fitted sheet versus the unfitted one, the cost accountability with, with that and what they would cost is so negligible that it's basically the same price when they're purchased in bulk as the hotels will do. As a result, the simple adoption of a mop, a long handle tool, which can be used over and over again, will also decrease the work injuries and lessen back and shoulder injuries and musculoskeletal injuries that are suffered day in and day out by our housekeepers. So uh, the simple adoption of this mop will reduce these injuries, which are, is not available at this time. Uh, there are before you published studies of the American Journal of Industrial Medicine dated 2009-2010 that show that the hotel workers have an injury rate of 25% higher than the regular workers and service workers that work in these hotels at a rate of 5.2. The housekeepers have the highest rate of injury by a classification of 7.9%, 50% higher than all hotel workers. These housekeepers before you have the highest rate of musculoskeletal disorders because they have to work on their hands and knees because they don't have mops and they have to lift 100 pound plus mattresses that we all stay in because they don't have a fitted sheet. Latina housekeepers have an injury rate of 10.6, nearly twice the rate of other housekeepers. And the overall, the over strike, the overall likelihood of high risk and low back injuries is 76%, which is very high. This study concluded Quote, immediate action is needed with respect to the control of the hazards of housekeepers. And as I said earlier, history often repeats itself because 42 years ago, the great Cesar Chavez led with CRLA, the California Rural, Rural Legal Assistance Organization. They led a fight against El Cortito, the short one, or El Brazo del Diablo, the devil's arm, also known as the short-handled hole which was being used in California at that time. That was back in 1969 to 75. In 1969, 48 of our states did not use this hole for obvious reasons, because they didn't want those injuries suffered for their farm workers. And what happened was, um, Cesar Chavez, who led this fight with CRLA, stated the following. Growers look at human beings as implements but if they had any consideration for the torture they suffer from, they would give up the short-handled hole. Because 48 states did, except California and another one, which I don't recall at the time. And those words were prophetic, because Justice Tobriner in 1975 in the Carmona case indicated that short-handed hole was so devastating with injuries for people that it shouldn't go forward. But he could not outlaw it as the, as the California Supreme Court Justice. And those words became prophetic because it took you legislators, you senators and, and assemblymen that could vote on this bill. In 1975, with our now Jerry Brown, our governor, who signed that bill and outlawed and banished that hole, 34% of the crippling back injuries that were suffered by farm workers went down. 34% did not have to suffer those problems. Good for business, less workers' comp cases, less workers' comp injuries, less pain out. So it was a good thing. And that was done 36 years ago. So as you see before us today, history can repeat itself once again. You guys and gals can make history, ma'am. And um, this resurrection of a 36-year-old problem could remedy itself now. Our same governor today could f sign this bill as well as you, the Senate here and the Assembly pushing for it, you can make history once again. Something that was done plus 36 years ago. This time for the housekeepers, not the farm workers. Be good for business, it would be good for injured workers who I represent. Less cases, less problems. 
From the adoption of a mop, which costs what? Less than $10. A fitted sheet where the costs to business people are negligible. They're not, they're not more expensive. And what you would do in this time around is get rid of El Cortito, as you would, get, you would implement the long-handed tool, the mop, which was done back then. And it is your turn now, and you can implement change and history by doing so. And thank you for your time. Any other witnesses? Thank you. My name is Dr. Robert Harrison, University of California, San Francisco. I'm an occupational medicine doctor and researcher. Um, I'm a former member of the California Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board. Um, and I'm here largely to testify on behalf of my patients um, who I see with work-related uh, muscle, tendon, and nerve injuries, including many of the housekeepers who you see behind you in the room. Um, and obviously I support this bill and urge you to vote aye on it. I want to make just a few points and I'll, I'll give these facts uh, to you later. Um, uh, first of all, you've already heard, but let me just emphasize again that housekeepers work in pain. Um, the studies have shown that 75% of housekeepers report having pain in the last 12 months. Um, and about two thirds of those have to visit a doctor or miss work because of their pain. Second, you heard about a lot of the repetitive and forceful exertions. Housekeepers, in fact, in studies, um, exert themselves about 850 times an hour. Um, so it's a very high level of repetition and exertion in this work. And in fact, the estimated risk of injuring the back is greater in hotel housekeepers than it is in most manufacturing jobs. And if you think about lifting the end of a bed of one of these heavy mattresses, in fact, lifting a corner of that luxury bed exceeds what the Centers for Disease Control, uh, our research institute, NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, recommends for a safe lifting load in manufacturing jobs. And finally, let me just emphasize again that um, we have a lot of other examples in other industries where the use of safe and simple and effective tools uh, markedly, reduce, markedly has reduced the rate of injuries. Um, you heard one example, the long-handled tool, um, which we showed uh, markedly reduced the rate of injuries in agricultural workers. And then the second is the nurses who take care of us in the hospital um, when they use uh, safe lift devices, so assistive lift to lift patients, have about a 30 to 40 percent reduction in the rate of injuries to the back and shoulder. So what we're talking about here is two very simple tools um, that are a very, very effective start that will undoubtedly, in my view, reduce the rate of injury among the housekeepers in this room. Um, finally, let me just say that um, I was a member of the Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board and um, saw a lot of the health and safety standards through um, the heat illness standard that we passed in California, um, a lot of other safety standards for construction workers. And what this bill will do is set in motion um, a safety and health standard that will require the standards board to at a base, at a minimum, include these two elements. And as a former member um, and a scientist on the Standards Board, I can tell you that having a directive from the legislature to the Safety and Health Standards Board works magic, is in this case absolutely essential to setting in motion this process. Thank you. Other witnesses? Go ahead. Good morning, Mom, sir. My name is Elia Sardumo. I have been working at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara for five years. I left the Philippines and came to California in search of opportunities and humane life. When I started working at the Hyatt Regency, I knew something was wrong. I wish someone came to my door to tell them that the Hyatt Regency 
we are not treated as a human beings. Every day, when my coworkers and I go to work, management expect us to have the whatever, whenever mentality. We clean 16 rooms during each shift. And the in the hotel bathrooms, I have to get on my knees to clean the floor and the bathtub well. Mom, sir, I bring this one because I forgot to bring my knees and I want to demonstrate how we clean our bathtub. I put my knee pad on my right knee. I can still swallowing now. For example, ma'am, sir, this is the bathtub. Especially my left knee, it's really hurt. I cannot work without my knee pad. This is the bathtub. We put the chemicals first and we scrub it. And then I get up. I hold this one to help to stand up. And then doing again under the knee of the sink. After that, my two knee again, this is the bathtub in the age. I put my knee there because we must clean all the walls. We spray the chemicals and leave it there for a few minutes before we uh, use the water to raise with the uh, warm water and then scrub it again. So after that, we will go again all the back, but the bathroom and I use my knee because we cannot avoid that some water is coming out inside the bathtub. So my knee again, I'm doing all over inside the bathroom. We're doing like this. That's the way we clean our bathroom. I wear knee, I wear knee pads under my uniform pants so that I can protect my knees better. Unfortunately, my knees are getting worse and worse. They are swollen and cause me pain. Just last week, my knees were under chronic pain. Everyone at the hotel knew I was pain. Management didn't ask me if I needed help or if I was okay. Management was simply concerned about hair on the floor and gas scores. I don't want to keep taking Tylenol to alleviate my body pain. Hyatt or any other hotel company does not have the right to expect us to clean the bathrooms on our knees. A while back, we had a long hand handled tools that help us pick up the tiny hairs in the bathrooms and bedrooms. One day, the long handled tools disappeared. We were never told why. It's probably just cheaper for the company to have my coworkers and me get on our knees. This is why I'm here today, ma'am, sir. I want to remind Californians, Hyatt, and other hotel companies that I came to this country not to work on my knees, but to make a just human living. Today, I am here to fight and advocate for long-handled tools. I want long-handled tools and pitted sheets, which, help, which will help reduce our injuries. Enough with our knee pains, enough with our back pains, enough with our hands pains. I am a giant fan. If Buster Posey, the catcher from the San Francisco Giants, can wear a helmet, face guard, knee pads, chest and rib protectors to protect his body, then Housekeepers can also have the right to pitted sheets and long-handled tools to protect our body 
Mom, sir, thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Other witnesses? Good morning, and thank you for your for your time. My name is Gilda Vallejo. I, I work uh, as a housekeeper at Hyatt Regency of Long Beach. I started working as a housekeeper at the Hyatt Regency of Long Beach 13 years ago after my husband's upholstery business shut down. Money was tight, so I started to work. Started to work. I thought I would be working only for a few months. Back then, the work was hard, but it wasn't until years later that I realized it was ruining my body. After, uh, excuse me, all the repetitive motion was slowly crippling me and began to experience terrible pain in my back, my lower back, my knees, and my shoulders. Then, a few years ago, the workload got worse. The higher where I work increased the number of rooms we clean in a shift, and because I have to move faster and get the work done, this took an even harder toll on my body. When I clean bathrooms, as the lady was showing just now, I do the same thing. So because of that, um, my hands and knees hurts. Now I work and most, mo now, excuse me, again, so now I work in constant pain. My back hurts, my shoulders ache, and my knees. I feel stuck in, in this situation, and I'm 60 years old, and sometimes I ask my, myself, how long can I handle this type of routine and work? My husband, two years ago, had a stroke and he relies on me most of the time. I need to keep and continue to work to support my family, but sometimes I feel I don't know how we're gonna be able to continue and take care of my, my husband at the same time. I'm here today because I hope that with the fitted sheet so we don't have to lift the mattresses and long handle tools, we don't have to get down on hands and knees some of the pressure on our bodies could be relieved, and I hope, hopefully, we can prevent other women from having to go through the pain I do every day. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. Any other witnesses? Good morning for everybody. I am Ninita Ibe, a hotel housekeeper at Hyatt Santa Clara for 10 years. I came to the United States from the Philippines in 1996 as an immigrant, hoping for a better life. I am here, here because with common sense, Solution like fitted seats and long handle tools, we can prevent housekeeper injuries on the job. On September 4, 2009, I was making a bed at the Hyatt. I felt severed, severed pain in my right shoulder and arms and tucking the seats. I work with flat seats and we have to pose our whole arm un under the mattress to make the bed correctly. I was assigned to do light duty, folding linens and towels and cleaning shower curtains which required me to use my injured arms and hands. I did, know I did not cover, recover. When I went back to my regular work to make the beds, I would use my knee and lift 
arm to arm to lift the mattress to tuck in the seat. I will see for Like that, I help my knee, and the other, I lift again my knee to help her to uh, up the mattress. And then, after that, I go back again to my studio. January 7, tw uh, 2011, I injured my left arm when making the bed. I had been receiving medical uh, treatment for my left arm. Now, I used to work with both arms, hands, but now I have lost the full uh, use of both my arms. I feel the pain from my right shoulder for my fingers. My life has changed drastically because of this injury. I cannot fully use my right arms and now my left arms. Every night I woke up from the pain and cannot go back to sleep for two hours and I hold a mug with my right arm. I spill my copy. When I take a bath, I cannot reach my hair. What's here? Everything I do now takes much longer and I am constantly aware of my injury. <coughs> if we work with fitted seat and higher, the work will be better. Fitted seats reduce the number of times we must bend and lift up the 100 pounds, pillow top mattresses to tightly tuck each corner of the bed. Many of my co-workers work with injuries. Some of my co-workers suffer from pain from their shoulder down to their wrist and fingers. Many of my co-workers clean on their knees. I see you again to I clean the restroom. And then down like that I wiping around the under the toilet under in the sink and over there I am going there and under the sink I wipe things it's very hard to mix the uh, other thing the, the edges so I stand I am very very uh, and then I go back again Be up and down on the hard floors cause bruises and pain. Some have bruises that cover their knees and their knees look black and swollen. We all had chance to use long handle tools to clean the bathroom. I think my co-workers co protect their knees better. I am sharing my experience of workplace injury because I am not the only housekeeper who suffered these injuries. We all deserve a safe workplace. I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Barry Broad on behalf of Unite Here and the Teamsters. Um, 
Let me say I was here when the short-handled hoe issue was being debated and participated in that debate. I wasn't here 40 years before that when the debate over abolishing child labor was um, occurred in which the employer said it would destroy the world as we know it if the little hands of children, their dexterous little hands, could no longer be used in certain industries. And in the ho short-handled hoe debate, agriculture as we know it was going to disappear. Um, and today, I mean, it's the same thing. If you listen quietly, you will hear the flutter of wings, and that's the wings of Chicken Little entering the room. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. It's always the same on these, these issues. The sky is falling. Frankly, we have a history of a work culture in which it's not so much that employers are trying to injure workers, but that it's a kind of benign neglect. Ask yourself, for example, why have people be on their hands and knees to do this work? And the answer will be, well, that's how it's always been done. Ask yourself why clerks in grocery stores all stand in this country and they sit in other countries. And the answer is, despite the fact that it causes back injuries and problems, it's just the way it's always been done. It's benign neglect until people stand up and raise the issue. This is the proper role of government to tell people, you gotta, you got to take care of this problem. The sky will not fall. The world will not come to an end. The hotel rooms will get cleaned. The injury rates will go down. The workers' comp claims will go down. And in fact, it will be good for the employers, and it will be good for the workers. That's how it will turn out. This is a good bill. Urgent I vote. Thank you. Any other witnesses? Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega here for the California Labor Federation. As you've seen today, these are injuries that are easily preventable. These are injuries that are clearly caused by something that um, could be easily remedied. And so we think that this is an urgent bill, not just for these women, but they are here representing tens of thousands of workers throughout California who are in the same situation. And we ask that you help them today. Thank you. Good morning, Paloma Perez, on behalf of Consumer Attorneys of California in support of this bill. Thank you. Mariko Yoshihara with the California Employment Lawyers Association in support of this bill. Any other witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Randy Knott. I'm the Vice President of Government and Legal Relations for the California Hotel and Lodging Association. Our association represents over 1,500 properties, approximately 170,000 rooms throughout the state of California. And um, right away, it's important to say that it's in our best interest as an, injury, as an industry to reduce injuries in the workplace, to reduce the absenteeism that comes with them, to reduce the, the pressure on the workforce, as well as trying to avoid, frankly, workers' compensation issues. Um, as a matter of practice, our properties provide training to housekeepers. We provide ergonomic tools as needed. Many of our properties make those tools. Uh, one is the bed wedge. You may have seen it. It's almost a plastic piece of looks like Swiss cheese that is able to be pushed into the corner of the bed, thus greatly reducing the amount of lifting. Also, ergo sticks are readily available. They're on the market and they're offered by our properties to housekeepers. They're often used to clean ceilings and can be attached to mops. Again, something readily available and uh, made available to our membership um, and their employees. As a matter of practice, uh, our national organization, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, provides video training specifically in ergonomics for housekeeping because, frankly, it's, it's good business to have healthy uninjured workers. Um, in addition, this is California. A number of our properties go ahead and provide stretching and even yoga prior to our uh, employees going to work in the morning to allow the housekeepers a chance to stretch and to make sure that they have an injury-free day. Uh, importantly, over the last five years, the green lodging push has gone into place. Um, that green lodging push 
has made a huge reduction, and industry-wide, at least amongst our membership, a reduction from 50 to 70 percent in the number of sheets and towels changed on a regular basis. Um, many guests just choose to opt out of housekeeping completely, or they have to opt in to have their sheets changed more than every three days if they're there for a long period of time. It has greatly reduced the amount of sheet changing that we've done. It's also saved a heck of a lot of water in the state of California. And from an environmental standpoint, it was important, but it was also the market forces that demanded we change the way we do business by unnecessarily cleaning and changing sheets and towels that were not, in fact, soiled by the same guest. Uh, we also just have folks who put up their do not disturb sign and choose to opt out of housekeeping completely. Interestingly, the proponents of the bill are relying on data that was collected in 2003 to 2005, just a bit before these green housing, uh, this green lodging push went through. So it, it does, does change the game a little bit. And in working with our membership, we found few, if any, injuries based uh, on the use of flat sheets. Most of the injuries we've seen with housekeepers have been related to slip and falls because the guest has left water on the bathroom floor. It's also worth noting, especially in our luxury uh, hotels that, that have been referred to quite a bit, that there's a standard to use three flat sheets, two on the bottom and one on the top. It, if you go, the standard is to go ahead, put all three flat sheets on, and in fact, tuck once. If you use fitted sheets, you must first tuck those fitted sheets and then put a top sheet on for sanitary purposes and again, tuck twice. So there is definitely a, a little bit of difference in terms of what is seen as best. In the economy hotels, uh, who tend to use more fitted sheets, they're not worried about the ironing and the additional laundering and the folding that goes into fitted sheets. And I don't know how many of you have done in bed, but folding fitted sheets is, is far more difficult than folding flat sheets. Um, we Interestingly, we looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, to, when we compared it to the Unite Here study. And we found that accommodations employees, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, were at about a 4.8 percent injury rate, whereas state and local government employees were at 5.4. So um, just something to think about. And I'd be remiss not to talk about the cost of the bill, but again, that was not, that's not our first interest, but, but it is something to think about. There are approximately 550,000 hotel rooms throughout the state of California. If we figure at the standard that the sheet must be at to replace those sheets, we're looking at $25 per bed. If we don't include double occupancy and we don't include the backup sheets that need to be available, we're already looking at about $15 million. And as the industry that is truly poised to bring California out of this recession, this kind of this push is very fragile. This rebound is very fragile, and it, and it is in fact something to think about. It is also more expensive to launder fitted sheets because of the elastic. They have to be laundered differently. They have to be folded differently. They have to be ironed differently. And there's that that cost is is you know with this fragile recovery that that is a cost we need to think about. The study that precipitated this this bill is noteworthy on several levels. Uh, for me, it's the inherent bias in the fact that three of the nine researchers were Unite Here employees. But I'm not going to go. I am not a doctor of occupational medicine, nor am I a quantitative analysis guru. So I'm going to in turn turn my testimony over to Dr. Jane Dareberry, who has done a study on the Buchanan study, and allow her to give her share her findings. Before that, I just have a question. So you start off your testimony with some of the good things hotels are doing, and and I'm sure there are many good actors in the hotel industry. Uh, this bill does not concern them, right? It concerns those that may not be as good. And what is the reason we don't want to apply a standard that these good hotels are doing, such as in ergonomics or giving long handle tools or mops, and why not make all hotels do that? Well, for several reasons. There's no consensus in the industry in terms of which are better, flat or fitted sheets, which are easier on the housekeepers in terms of doing that. The, the general consensus was if you use flat sheets, you tuck once. If you use fitted sheets, you tuck twice. What about the long handle? Uh, the long handle the tools, the majority of the hotels offer them. They are screw-ins to either attach to a mop handle. And it's at the discretion of the housekeeping staff in terms of how they want to perform their work. Just as my employer can give me a wrist guard to prevent me from getting carpal tunnel, 
I'm not necessarily going to use it if I find it uncomfortable. There is some some line of discretion, and this this is very invasive in terms of what we do. There are Cal OSHA standards. If there are abuses, there are plenty of protections for workers that already exist in the industry to make sure we protect them. And it's frankly bad business to injure our employees or, or negligently injure them. Would, would there be opposition to just having the long handle tools available at every hotel? I. At this point, it w I think it would make more sense to have this go through the regulatory process, and I think it's important to listen to the fact that the findings of the study are not medically proven in any way. I think the study brings up some really good questions, and it would be worth studying further to find out if, in fact, this is valid. I, because in my professional opinion, and it actually in Dr. Derryberry's and several others, we do not believe these findings are valid. I think it's a premature action on the part of the government to intervene at this point. I think it's worth looking further into. Does any other committee member have a question of this witness? If not, we'll listen to the next one. Just, All right. just, just quickly, what we're going to hear about is, is what study? The uh, study that the sponsors used was a study done by Unite Here, who also, just for purposes of information, are in negotiations with Hyatt Regency right now, so it's, um, it's a, an interesting timing. Okay. That study was commissioned by them, and three of the authors of the, employ of the study are employees of Unite Here. Uh, the, the regulatory mechanism has that board. We understood that the doctor, the medical doctor, was a member of that board. Have they done a study No, they have not. This? No, and, and perhaps further study is warranted prior to have, legislation. Has there been any application to them to ask them to deal with this issue? Not to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. I, uh, next witness, go ahead. Yes, I'm Dr. Jane Deerberry, and I am from Texas. Uh, how I got involved in this, I'm an occupational medicine physician. I, um, in addition to my practice of occupational and preventive medicine, I also have had a, a long-term interest and involvement in ergonomic issues. I uh, have served on the Board of Scientific Counselors to NIOSH. I have testified at a U.S. Congressional hearing on the um, ergonomic standard when that was initiated 10 years ago, and I've also uh, testified as an expert witness to the Department of Labor. I've also uh, uh, published and done research in the field uh, specific to back pain and upper extremity disorders. And from that, uh, I had met an attorney who became a friend, and when all this came about, he represents one of the hotels. Yeah, a few months ago, he asked me to review the article that you were referencing, and I did that gratis. I was not paid to do it, and I read it and offered my medical uh, opinion, and then based on that, a few months later, he said, we would like you to be involved in this. Um, I had a lot of concerns because, like everyone else, I want the best thing for my patients, for employees. When I was a young occupational medicine doctor many years ago, um, I was very enthusiastic about ergonomics, uh, hoping it would really help people feel better, reduce injuries, but I didn't see that in my practice. That's why I got involved in it. And so when I looked at the study, you have to understand, these recommendations are based on one study. And this is a study, what we call an observational study. That means that it's a starting point. It is a study that cannot tell cause and effect, and it's very subject to bias. And in fact, it can mask true cause and effect. So if this study looked at a bunch of data and said that there was increased uh, risk in this occupation, uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt. What should happen with that study is that then that should prompt further better design studies so you can see, okay, if it's elevated, first of all, is it elevated? And secondly, why? That way, when you investigate it, you're more likely, if you need a solution, to know the right solution. Well, I want to, um, again, remember, I am, occupational medicine is in the specialty of preventive medicine. And I spent a lot of time with my patients and my workers trying to promote physical fitness. In this country, I see more workers who have aches and pains at work because they don't get enough exercise, not because they do. Housekeepers get a lot of exercise. They get all they need. And I want to, just to give you an idea of why you want to watch the unintended consequences of a good idea uh, trying to help. I want to cite a, a study from Harvard uh, came out a couple of years ago about housekeepers. And what these Harvard investigators did 
was I randomly took 84 hotel housekeepers uh, from different hotels and they um, trained uh, them, educated them that the specific work they did as housekeepers satisfied the, the Surgeon General's definition for being a fit adult. And this is a true statement. They also educated them why the bending, why the lifting, why the pushing and pulling uh, helped keep them physically fit. They followed these uh, housekeepers and compared them to those who were not given that training. What they found in six months was they had significantly lower weight, lower blood pressure, lower pulse, and they perceived themselves, although it wasn't true, to be getting more physical exercise than those who were not trained. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, from the, the overwhelming medical literature, uh, there is no indication that the routine activities at work, such as housekeepers perform, are injurious. Uh, ergonomics is very, very helpful, and it's helpful for comfort and sometimes for productivity. It will not reduce injuries, and you have to understand that. And also, what one person may like, a fitted sheet, another one's going to hate. And so you do need to allow for flexibility, not mandate something that your housekeepers may not even want. They may want it just because they've been told it will make things easier. There are an awful lot of things you might want to consider uh, for comfort with housekeepers than things that have been disproven. Um, I, I stress that that article is, uh, comes to a very different conclusion than all of the mainstream medicine. In medicine, we have what's called the Cochrane Collaboration. It is an international consortium of scientists and doctors. Uh, it's it's uh, financed by uh, governments, including the U.S., and those thousands of scientists regularly review, review medical studies and rate them on quality. An observational study would barely be given any consideration at all. But based on the current literature, there in 2007, their uh, conclusions were that there is no evidence that ergonomic training or providing lift hoist to prevent lifting has any decrease in injury rates. And that's the Cochrane Consortium, which is the uh, most respected in the world. In addition, even NIOSH, uh, which I've been on the board of directors of, a board of scientific counselors, even they have been traditionally very much biomechanically oriented, ergonomic oriented, as opposed to in Europe where they're more uh, biopsychosocial uh, and human factor oriented. Even NIOSH has concluded with their studies that psychosocial and other extraneous issues uh, play just as important a part in injury rates as do the actual physical uh, uh, requirements of the job. So my concern reading this and providing my occupational input is that what you're doing to, you, to hopefully solve a problem won't accomplish that. In addition, something that disturbed me about the study when it said that it was the job was hazardous, and I think that's a real disservice to housekeepers. You know, I showed you the Harvard study where the mindset can really make a difference in a perception and even on our physical health. We all know that. And so with this, if you look at, by comparison, the injury rates. Well, the service sector that they made the comment in this article that the housekeepers have the highest, uh, in the hotel industry, has the highest injury rates of all the service sector. Well, the service sector, I would imagine, or most of us in this room, uh, it is a varied uh, uh, group. It includes health care, attorneys, tax prepara uh, uh, preparation, hair cutters, automobile mechanics, movie industry. All of those people count as service sector. So if you look at the overall service sector injury rates, it is 4.2 per 100 per year. Housekeeping in the overall is, is 5.9 uh, injuries per year. We'd like no injuries, but frankly, that is not a significant difference. Uh, that is not, <coughs> excuse me, does not indicate that it's hazardous. Uh, it does mean, if in this study, that they did find an unusually high 
that uh, rate that they do need to investigate it further, but to on the basis of an uh, observation study to to promote regulation when you really don't even know why and if those were uh, elevated, it, it's going to mislead you. Remember, an increased injury rate, if somebody, if an OSHA log, which is notoriously inaccurate, if it says that they have increased injuries, they're counting paper cuts and they're, carding, they're counting severed limbs. Now, as a physician, I want to know if they have a whole bunch of increased paper cuts versus severed limbs. One's a safety issue. There's a big problem. I'm going to handle it differently. If it's paper cuts, what I'm going to do is investigate managerial issues, job satisfaction issues. Two very different explanations for why those injury rates are up. So in conclusion for me, I would hope that uh, we, we provided the analysis of that article. Uh, I hope that it's helpful to you, and I do uh, want to say that I respect what you're trying to do to make things better, but I just hope that you use good science when you make that decision. I have a question for the witness. Um, so let's let's step aside from the studies. Uh, my sense is no one in this room probably cleans their kitchens on their hands and knees. And the reason that people use mops is, I got to think, it, it's quicker and it's probably better for you to not clean on your hands and knees. I'm just, just common sense ergonometry. Wouldn't you rather have people clean with a mop than on their hands and knees? Well, certainly not with my knees, but... Um uh, again, you're looking at comfort, and you're looking at, uh, frankly, what I do is uh, the, the person who should answer that question is the housekeeper. And I think that we're wise to allow for flexibility and allow someone to do what they want to do. I have, uh, in fact, there are some things I would prefer to do on hands and knees. Uh, bathing children, for as a matter of fact. I mean, you can't use a long handle for that. And... Um, I think that having ergonomic uh, equipment for you, uh, if you want to use it, is fine. Mandating that you have to do that, I think, will irritate some people, including housekeepers. So you would support having our hotels having long-handle tools available for housekeepers? Oh, that absolutely, but I want to emphasize it's for comfort and possibly productivity. It won't reduce your injury rates. And then a question about the lifting. Um, so I've been informed that when we instituted some lifting reforms in the nursing industry, it reduced the back injuries. Would, would you agree with that? Or? Uh, it may have in the short run, but not in the long run. What it does, the largest, best study done with it was a randomized controlled trial, and that's, that's the type of study we really pay attention to because it's probably the most valid. And in that study of, uh, of healthcare workers, they found that initially there was a slight decrease in nurses that were not allowed to lift. They, had, they were required to use a lifting hoist. But later, after several years, what they found, they had three groups. One did whatever they wanted to do lifting. The other one, they were required to use lifting hoists every, uh, hoists every time. Third one, they could do it if they wanted to. They didn't have to. At the end of several years, the outcomes for injury was absolutely the same. The only difference was those that didn't lift felt they were more, they perceived themselves as being more comfortable. Uh, it felt better to them. They weren't as fatigued. But the injury rate was the same in all of those three groups. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? You know, doctor, I, I want to, um, you know, ask you, um, you know, in your presentation, you, you indicated that, um, that we ought to give, um, you know, the individual worker, that kind of flexibility as to what accommodations or what procedures that they may be uh, using relative to cleaning. Uh, the, the, the problem, however, is that you had these witnesses come before us, and I gather that they've been cleaning, kneeling down on their knees for years and years. And because of that, um, because of the repetitive nature, the pressure that's on their joints and what have you, it's gotten to a point where, you know, they are in desperate pain. So, so ought we not then, as a legislature, to do something about how to prevent those injuries and those problems from occurring? 
I think that that definitely is advantageous. I, I, I think comfort is extremely important. And also, as we age, we do have a harder time with flexibility. We are more uncomfortable, and we are an aging society. We need to think about that. Um, and so, and I stress that, yes, having that and allowing for that will, uh, I think, is a good thing to do. Uh, but the way as a physician that I also approach it is, a lot of times a person's uncomfortable not because they're not doing enough or they're in a posture, it's because they have a physical imbalance. If they want to work without hurting, they may need to do some stuff outside of work uh, to improve their conditioning for that particular activity. In other words, if they're having wrist or hand pain, um, my response may be to also give them some upper extremity weightlifting to do at home. Uh, and doing that and flexibility, their, their problem goes away. They can still perform the job, but they don't hurt. Other times it is an er ergonomic, recommending a different way to do it. Same way with knee knees are tough. They're a bad joint, especially as we get older. And I think it's, it's very important if you are, if you decide and you are working on your knees to, to have padding. I think that helps. That's very reasonable. And, and, and so if, if, if we know that, you know, if you continue to do a particular movement on an ongoing basis uh, for an extended period of time, that, that, that shouldn't we then try to find ways to prevent the beginning of those kinds of movement? Because we know that if you keep doing that, you're going to end up, you know, having an injured worker. Well, in, in due respect, that's not correct. Doing those activities doesn't cause the injury, doesn't cause the condition. Uh, in fact, most of these conditions that we treat, upper extremity, tendonitis, tennis elbow, carpal tunnel, the treatment is exercise. <coughs> and uh, it's so if, if something, if you're saying repetitive motion caused an injury or illness, then why do we treat it with re repetitive motion and strengthening to get rid of it? So uh, it doesn't cause injury, but if you develop a medical condition, knee arthritis, et cetera, you're going to have a tough time kneeling. For those people, we need to make job accommodations. We need to give them padding. We need to educate them, uh, especially strengthening exercises is what I give knee patients. Mr. Chair, this is my last point on this. So, so l l let's just talk about lifting up the mattresses and putting the sheets under the mattress and so on. If we know that that constant lifting over an extended period of time is in fact going to cause some injuries and, and hurt, uh, you know, ought we not to then say, well, instead of doing that, maybe we need to have another procedure so that we don't get them started in that to the point where they are injured and then we have to go and start fixing them? Well, again, swimming upstream, that's not correct. Doing, performing those activities does not cause back injury. This isn't just my opinion. I'm representing the overwhelming majority of medical literature on it. It's what science tells us, and it's hard to get our head around it, but it's true. And so there, it doesn't cause injury. And, uh, and I would have to see some statistics to show that it increased comfort. My understanding with the fitted sheets situation was the, when I talked to some of the uh, fellows at Hyatt, uh, they said that the reason they didn't want fitted sheets is because their housekeepers didn't. So they were throwing a fit at the thought of fitted sheets. They thought it would slow down their work. Um, you done, Senator Yee? Yeah. Okay. Before Senator Leno asks a question, I, I, let me ask a couple more questions. So I'm looking at a letter, I don't know if the committee has it, from the first doctor that testified. Um, and he cites a multitude of studies, not just mm -hmm. one. Right. Uh, seven or eight of them. And one of them is from 2010 by Maris that says the risk of back injuries in hotel housekeepers is higher than most manufacturing jobs. He cites a study by Orr in 2006 that says lifting a corner of a luxury bed exceeds what NIOSH recommends for a safe lifting load. He cites two studies from Hagberg and Woods uh, in 89 and 99 that both say that scientists have shown that housekeeping work demands a high level of physical effort, repetitive work, awkward postures, and high stress loads on the muscles. Have you looked at these studies? You're prepared to comment on them, or are you not? Yes, not, not for those. I mean, I'd have to look. Uh, but the literature is full of those articles. Uh, but again, not best on the, not if they're observational studies or not well designed, they can be misleading. We do a lot of assuming in our society, all societies do. We assume, and our culture is, that using your back causes injury. 
uh, and that has never been demonstrated with sound science. There's a lot of disagreement in there, and I butted heads with people with NIOSH, the ergonomist, about that. But the truth of the matter is that when you look at injuries, people have back pain regardless of whether or not they do heavy work. It's as common among sedentary workers as heavy manual laborers. In twin studies in Europe, if you have identical twins, one goes on to do heavy manual lifting, the other one doesn't, their incidence of disc disease is the same. So we know that a lot of it has to do with genetics, fitness, et cetera. You can't just assume that an activity is going to cause it. It does behoove you, however, if you're going to be doing physically demanding work, that you be in condition for it. Uh, however, I will say that it doesn't appear to do any good to, to do ergonomic training or education about the proper way to lift. That doesn't seem to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, San Leno? Thank you, Chairman Lou. I have to say, this has been one of the most incredulous presentations I've ever heard. To hear you say that housekeepers, let me be more accurate, some housekeepers hate fitted sheets, I would be much more impressed if there was at least one housekeeper in this room who came to testify today that they hate fitted sheets. I would presume you have no fitted sheets in your home. Oh, all mine are fitted. All of them are fitted. Right. I think that's all you can buy in... Uh, I wonder why the market demands Well, I was a candy striper. ...and that you can't even find non-fitted sheets. I wonder where the hotels go to find these non-fitted sheets. It's just, as they say, incredulous. And that ergonomic tools will not reduce injuries. And that it, it, it <laughs> as I said, it's, it's rather an amazing presentation. It, I know we have a long line of folks who wish to testify, uh, Mr. Chair, but I wouldn't mind if uh, the doctor from UCSF could just respond briefly, maybe within a couple of minutes, to some of what we've heard. Why don't we let the opposition fully testify okay. and we'll recall it. Makes good sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is John Manderfeld. I'm uh, president of the California Lodging Industry Association. We represent hundreds of hotel owners. I'm also president of a company that operates about 30 hotels, and uh, I've been operating hotels for 40 years. In that 40 years, I've cleaned a lot of guest rooms, uh, made a lot of beds, cleaned a lot of bathrooms. I want to comment on the fitted sheets issue first because I am speaking in opposition to it because I believe it's bad legislation, it's bad for the worker, it's bad for the travel industry and tourism industry, and it's bad for the uh, for ecology. Uh, first of all, for the worker, uh, we have tried fitted sheets in our hotels. We've uh, had massive uh, uh, trials with those, a 320-room hotel. We found that they failed for a number of reasons. The workers did not like them. Uh, they had to do a lot of pulling and tugging to get the wrinkles out. It uh, was time-consuming, very, very difficult to fold. I fold my fitted sheets. I know how difficult it is. Uh, almost impossible to stack. Uh, you can carry very few of them on the cart. You have to run back to the laundry to get more, many more trips to the laundry. Uh, but also, the fitted sheets you use at home, you may wash them 50 times over a several-year period, and that's about when they wear out. In a hotel, they're washed every day. And so they wear out after about 50 days and have to be discarded. Uh, they, as they wear out, they uh, deteriorate the elasticity. They bulk, bunch up. You can't use them effectively. It's hard to exactly decide when, when they're unusable. Uh, in, for back injuries, we see um, most back injuries come from pulling, not from pushing. And these require more pulling and tugging. Uh, in my 40 years, I've never seen a back injury or any type of injury associated with flat sheets. And uh, we operate 2,500 guest rooms, and that's a lot of cleaning. Um, the, environmentally, uh, our laundry co uh, consumption of water, use of wastewater, use of chemicals, use of heat uh, for uh, electrical heat and for washing cycles, use of natural gas went up tremendously because they are bulkier. They're more difficult to wash. They take longer cycles, longer cycles to dry. You know this from your home use. And it just wastes a whole bunch of electricity and gas, et cetera. Uh, so they're bad from that point of view as well. Um, obviously, bad for the, the tourism industry because we have a tourism industry that lost about 23% of its revenue in 2009, uh, didn't gain much of that back in 2010, is struggling. These are very costly 
uh, products to use, the consumption of them is greater, the inventory problems and so forth. I do want to comment on the short handle, long handle issue because uh, our hotels, about 30 of them, we offer both. And we find that there's a, a pretty good percentage of workers who prefer the short handle, particularly working in confined spaces. I heard testimony about hoes and so forth being used in farms, and, you know, and I, I agree with that testimony. But this, when you're working in a confined space, a small closet, a bathroom, a long-handled device may not be right for every worker. Uh, we find that they tend to whack the mirror, the furniture, they often poke themselves with, it, with them, and a lot of times when you're using two workers on a guest room, they, they're whacking each other with these, with these tools. So they're, they're, um, you know, they're not for every worker. We give people a choice. A high percentage of them prefer the short-handled, uh, and uh, some prefer the long-handled. Thank you. Other witnesses? Mr. Chair and members, uh, Mike Belote for the California Lodging Industry Association. I'm obviously not an industrial hygienist or an occupational physician. Uh, what I have witnessed today is really a mini occupational safety and health standards hearing. You have listened to remarkably uh, divergent views on the same issues. Uh, We're not here to say the sky is falling. Uh, my Mr. Broad, for whom I have great respect, has suggested that we're suggesting the end of lodging as we know it if the bill passes, and we've never said that. What we did say is that this sounds like a regulatory matter. This is why you have the OSHA Standards Board. And to try to sit as a mini uh, standards board, it seems to me, is uh, inappropriate and really a kind of a slippery slope. You will now be mediating occupational safety and health issues in a way that it doesn't seem to me is the design of the system. The system is to delegate to the standards board uh, the, the obligation to listen to the experts and see who is right. You have obviously heard emotional testimony from people who work very, very hard, and, and I, I found it compelling. And, you know, obviously I don't work hard like that, and so I, I can't sit in judgment. But what I can say is you have a regulatory system that is designed to listen to those debates and to weigh the arguments of the uh, gentleman from San Francisco versus the doctor you listened to second. It seems to me that delegating this to the standards board, which, for which we would have no objection at all, is the appropriate remedy. And so for that reason, we would oppose, unless amended, to just delegate the issue, very complicated issue, to the standards board. Thank you. Other witnesses? Good morning, members. Teresa Cook on behalf of the California Travel Association, also respectfully opposed. We would um, mirror the comments made earlier, particularly with the overall health of the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Caldwell, representing the American Resort Development Association. It's timeshare industry. We're talking about the members of the timeshares uh, who pay association mm -hmm. fees. They're going to have to pay. They're the ones that are going to pay for the increased cost of the, the new sheets. And so we would urge and oppose. Thank you. Other witnesses? Why don't we have Dr. Harrison, if he's still here, to come back up? I will be brief. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I just would answer, I guess I would just address myself to four points and just really to try to set what I think are the, what, what my understanding of the facts are. And I don't think this is um, subject to, to varying levels of interpretation by scientists. Um, the first is that we heard that um, somehow the study upon which the bill uh, rests um, was somehow biased um, or because it had the participation of three union members. The, the fact is that the lead author of this study was Dr. Nicholas Krauss, who is a professor of occupational medicine and epidemiology at the University of California, San Francisco. I know Dr. Krauss. He's a colleague. I didn't participate in the research. Um, it was a uh, peer-reviewed study. It was funded by the Centers for Disease Control, um, and uh, it's been published in several scientific journals that are first-rate. Um, and there are some, uh, one, I think one paper has some co-authors from Unite Here um, who contributed to the study. Um, but um, uh, Dr. Krauss is now the chair of um, the University of California-funded 
um, Center for Occupational Environmental Health at the University of California, LA. So that's Dr. Krauss, that's the study that we're talking about. Um, the second is that there are multiple um, peer-reviewed studies that show that these same ergonomic hazards that the housekeepers are talking about, lifting, bending, stooping, not only cause discomfort, we heard a lot about discomfort, but they cause injury. They cause disability. They cause back injuries. They cause rotator cuff injuries. They cause carpal tunnel syndrome. And it's not just, I believe, my opinion, I, I, although I believe the, the, the same, um, but, and I, I apologize, you know, I, I didn't bring the, what's called the yellow book, but here it is, wonders of Google. It's published by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in 1997, and it's called Musculoskeletal Disorders and Workplace Factors, and it's a review of thousands of articles, many hundreds of which were very well performed, um, based on studies done from the 1980s onward. And it concludes that these workplace ergonomic risk factors cause injuries. Um, this was followed up by the National Academy of Sciences, which had uh, a similar peer review and has published a 400-page book that basically says the same thing. Um, so there are hundreds of papers, um, along with other studies of housekeepers, not just the Dr. Krauss paper, and I gave you the articles. Um, the third point is that there's no evidence, to my knowledge, that physical fitness or keeping in better shape actually reduces or prevents injuries. It can reduce discomfort, but does nothing to affect the weight of a bed or the posture that a worker has to go in inside a closet or reaching down into a bathtub. That just doesn't make any sense on the face of it. Um, and I'm, I'm not aware that there's actually any scientific studies that show that being physically fit reduces your risk of rotator cuff impingement or a muscle injury um, from lifting the corner of a bed. Um, and the fourth point I just wanted to make as a former member of the standards board, I heard many, many similar arguments that if we would require tools or something for all employers that we're somehow forcing workers to use them, but that's not correct um, with all due respect to the previous um, statement. Um, this would require that employers have them, they make them available, but it doesn't mean that somebody has to use them if they're in a closet and it's easier to use a short-handled mop. But employers must make them available to workers. That's really all this says. So with, with that, if there's any other questions or while I'm up here. Thank you. Doctor. Thank you. <clears throat> any other witnesses? Uh, questions from the committee? Senator Wiley? Well, <laughs> we're a lot of testimony. Um, and, and I think it's deserving of... of um, some real thought on our part. I'd just like to make a, a couple of points. Um, clearly, this is this is this is hard work. It's it's manual work. Um, women who do this in their homes uh, do it once a day, or most women. I certainly don't. I certainly wouldn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm one of those men who, do, who does it as seldom as possible. Uh, but I have done a lot of very heavy manual labor uh, in the sun, uh, lifting a lot of very heavy things uh, in construction. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to point out that um, when I did that many years ago, um, um, well, people historically have done that. My all my grandparents were raised on farms. Uh, it's hard, heavy work. It's seven twenty-four. That's what they all did. Uh, I was in a business where a family business where summers I was expected to work, unload box cars of lumber by hand, lift it by hand. Uh, it's hard work, and um, uh, I have a lot of respect for people who do that. In those days, uh, we did not have many uh, immigrants uh, doing that work. Uh, now we have a lot more. 
Um, so, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for the hard work part. The thing that I'm impressed by, many, many elements, is less the impact of cost, but the impact on the workers. Uh, in my company, we had, oh, about 120, uh, and uh, the majority of those worked outside. I knew every single one of them. And uh, I cared a lot about them being able to work safely without injuries uh, because I cared about them as people. But beyond that, um, there was a cost issue. So we had contests among the folks that worked uh, doing those sorts of jobs uh, about who could have the least number of injuries. Uh, a lot of it was paying attention uh, and the uh, and having their coworkers very concerned about you know making sure they didn't have injuries. So there clearly is a big financial incentive in any company that I, I can't, it's it's. It would be strange to me that a company wouldn't want to do everything it could possibly do to reduce the cost. However, to me, the bottom line in this whole thing is what is best for these people working. And I'm willing to, I'm willing pretty much to support what I think would be the best and the safest for these workers. The problem I have is I don't think we know that. We have extended testimony by two uh, physicians. Um, one cites uh, and certainly has credentials from the University of California at San Diego uh, and cites studies. The other cites um, not just published studies, but uh, the standard of, uh, and I won't get this right, the double blind, uh, you know, with controls and all of that sort of study. Uh, some of the results of that apparently are counterintuitive, and she was very straightforward about that. The other expert witness uh, cites peer-reviewed studies. Uh, I end up thinking, as I did sometimes in health committee, this is just the wrong place to figure this out. Uh, and I don't think any of us are, frankly, able to make these judgments. That the work is hard, there's no doubt. Laying carpet is hard. Anyone who's watched someone lay carpet, that's a hard job. Anyone who's watched someone finish concrete, that's a hard job. Um, and so this is not as uh, strenuous as those are, but there's, there's hard jobs out there, and I don't think anyone would disagree. I just don't feel that I can make a, a good judgment trying to sit in, in, and, and judge these various articles, and that, to me, is the, the key to it, the, the research. So I would ask the author, would you be willing to, to amend the bill to require uh, an examination of these or to make its own study? I know there's things called meta studies where they look at all the other studies, but to have a regulatory body, uh, uh, and I guess the appropriate one is... Uh, OSH, OSH, O S H S B, do a study so we can find out if if it turns out to me that there's a safer way uh, to operate. Uh, the cost is not the cost is not the key to me there. The cost is that is that they work in a safe environment. So would the author be willing to consider uh, doing that? Senator Weiland, I, I appreciate uh, your comments. Um, you've always been a man of reason since uh, we've known each other, uh, since my days uh, in the Assembly. And I know your background uh, has always been, a uh, before being an elected official, you know, a businessman and a very uh, hardworking businessman at that. So I have a lot of respect uh, uh, for you and, and uh, uh, for your family. You, you've come uh, the way you've articulated and characterized it, a family of very hard workers. Uh, with regards to uh, the regulatory process and, and uh, going through that process, um, I've never been keen with regards to uh, devising amendments on the fly uh, when we're in committee. Uh, I would say this, that I'd be more than happy because I know you as an individual to be an extremely reasonable individual. 
Uh, I've uh, engaged with you on a whole variety of other issues. Uh, now that I'm a new senator, um, our relationship, uh, uh, I would characterize as, as uh, would become even much more closer regardless of our political affiliations right now. Uh, I, would say I, I don't know too. about political affiliations, but <laughs> at least on a personal, yeah. reasonable level. I said regardless of political affiliation. Oh, regardless. Okay, there we so. go. <laughs> well, you know, what, what I would say is this. It used to be a Democrat for 20 years, you know. What I, I, you wouldn't want to know the organizations. I, my Republicans wouldn't want to know the organizations I've been a member of. What I would say was this. Senator Weiland, I'd be more than happy to uh, 